What's up everybody, this is Matt Brown with part six in our Enterprise IoT pen testing series. We are going to be taking a look today at mobile clients and those applications that are interacting with IoT devices that are the target of a IoT pen test. My name is Matt Brown. If you're new to this channel, I am an IoT security professional, a bug bounty hunter. I have uh, won competitions finding zero days in Amazon's IoT devices. So if I can do that, uh, hopefully I can speak authoritatively on this IoT pen testing process. I've also worked on both sides uh, on uh, procuring these services for businesses as well as performing them. So I uh, just want to share some insights into what this is like and specifically in relation to mobile applications, which is what we're looking at today. Uh, like I said, this is part six in a series that we've been doing, so definitely go back and look at those other, other videos. Links should be in the description. So, as we uh, click through here, first I want to talk a little bit, I got a couple slides that talk specifically about the mobile device setup, because testing mobile applications gets you into a whole new realm of, do I need, you know, do I need a separate phone? Do I need a lot of different phones? And uh, definitely a physical phone is going to probably be necessary where some purely mobile assessments are going to, uh, may maybe you can do all those in some kind of an emulator, right? Especially if it's an Android application, you could probably run that completely in an emulator, but that's not gonna really work for most IoT use cases. And that's because a lot of IoT devices are using Bluetooth or directly using Wi-Fi in the application, not just like over the network, but actually need to uh, communicate over Wi-Fi directly. And the emulator is not going to be able to do that. Now the emulator will be able to make a fake wireless connection, but Bluetooth connections, like it, the application's not actually gonna be able to communicate with something. So that's why, uh, why we do need a physical device. And I'm going to make a maybe controversial statement in that most IoT pen tests that involve a mobile application should spend a probably 90% of their time targeting the Android application. And there's a couple reasons why, and it actually stems just from the regular mobile application pen testing world and it's the strategy of if you have to do an assessment on both applications, you're oftentimes going to first reverse engineer the Android application. And then if you find a vulnerability, you're going to go look for it, that same exact vulnerability in the iOS application. The reason for this is because the Android ecosystem is just way more open. Uh, it's easier to get root on a device like I have sitting over here on my desk. Um, there are some iPhones, uh, the older ones, that you can use the check rain uh, vulnerability to, to get root on them, but they are finicky and uh, they can't install some of the latest apps. And Android applications are Java-based, and so decompiling Java is just so much easier than uh, kind of the native code on iOS. So altogether, way better experience to be targeting the Android application, and when we are doing an IoT pen test especially, we're really interested in a subset of the mobile application most of the time. We're interested in those parts of the mobile application that are communicating with our IoT device, not just generally like the storage in the app or, or other things that a traditional mobile pen test is going to cover. So uh, that being said, I have these instructions. This is more of a reference. I'm not gonna go too, too deep into this in this video, but uh, I highly suggest if you do need to pick up this capability, I'm really speaking to my pen testers right now uh, and less people who are procuring these services, but this is, uh, my go-to path. Go get a, a refurbished uh, Pixel device that is unlocked. There are some that are that are uh, you know uh, locked to a carrier, so you can't use one of those. But you need to get an unlocked uh, Pixel device. You can buy refurbished ones pretty cheap on Amazon, and then you're going to go through this song and dance to unlock the bootloader and uh, put. A, a kind of an OEM uh, image onto it and then uh, go through the process of, of uh, patching the, uh, that boot image. 
in order to gain root on the device. Once you have root on the device, there's lots of cool things that we can do. We can start hooking into applications with Frida. So Frida itself is another rabbit hole that we're not gonna go too deep on. This, I just got one slide. We could, we could give an entire presentation on how to, how to instrument applications using Frida, but I suggest you go to this GitHub link and you uh, invest some time in learning this tool if you are a pen tester. Uh, even if you're an IoT pen tester, but you're oftentimes, uh, you know, have mobile applications that interact with your IoT device, this is super useful. And uh, as we can see towards the end in this slide, I'm just going to jump ahead. The, the big goal oftentimes of modifying an app or instrumenting an application is we want to see inside of the web requests that our app is sending out to the cloud, maybe, or to a device especially when it's sending data to the cloud, it's going to be using TLS. It's going to encrypt that traffic, right? And so uh, we oftentimes need to bypass certificate pinning in order to see inside of those web requests. And so I've got a, I've got a number of uh, kind of instructions here for you that you can use as a reference to go back and uh, accomplish that goal. But just, just, just to set that picture, that is the big picture goal oftentimes is to, is to gain an insight into the, the HTTP web requests that are wrapped inside of that encrypted TLS tunnel. Uh, that being said, I want to go back. Uh, a, a few videos ago, we looked at this architecture diagram to kind of talk about the differences uh, between uh, network services and network communications and how we kind of broke those, uh, those topics down in this guide. So today, what I want to hone in on is uh, a part of this diagram that we, we kind of glossed over last time, and that's this communication between the mobile application and the IoT device. So before, we were focusing on looking for vulnerabilities in the network services that are hosted on the server side of this client and server communication. So over here, on the left side of the diagram, we see the mobile application acting as a client connecting to the server services on the IoT device. And again, yeah, last time we focused on vulns in the IoT device services. Now we're gonna turn and we're gonna discuss some specific vulnerabilities that I often see uh, in enterprise IoT devices, especially in the commercial security sector uh, with uh, the kind of onset of the OnVIF standard and just some just some kind of market uh, agreement around what is okay and what is not okay in the industry and some interesting kind of artifacts of uh, standards and how they get developed and some vulnerabilities that we'll find but uh, so that's what we're going to be targeting today is problems with the client side of these communications so to do that i want to jump in and introduce you to HTTP authentication because a lot of times there will be other protocols being used, but but most of the time uh, we we will find, especially in the in the commercial security sector, that uh, some kind of an API that is implemented in HTTP, and part of that is actually specified in the OnVIF standard. That is a standard that is. Uh, implemented on many of these security cameras, like the one that we have over on our desk for our case study today. So HTTP authentication. This, these are mechanisms to provide authentication to, to have for certain you know, web requests, API calls, or accessing information in a web GUI. Uh, there's two main different methods. There's tons of other ways to perform authentication, but HTTP authentication, there's two key ways. There is basic authentication and digest authentication. And at a very high level, what basic authentication does is it sends in clear text, now that sounds really bad because it is, and most of the time it's okay because you put it inside of an encrypted TLS tunnel. So, uh, but the way that basic authentication works at the HTTP layer is it just concatenates the username with a colon and then the password and then it base64 encodes it, which is easy to undo, and then it sends that in a header. Digest authentication, on the other hand, takes the username, the password, and, a, and some other 
items in the HTTP request, and it uses those to sign that HTTP request so that the information being transmitted in the HTTP header is not in any way reversible to the password. And so this is, a, is kind of a, a, a way that someone can prove that they have the password without transmitting it over the network. And so this digest authentication method has been, uh, has kind of become the go-to method for when the, me the communications medium is not secure. So there's a couple of situations in which that could occur. One is if you're just using clear text HTTP traffic that's sending data over the network, completely unencrypted. The other is when you're using TLS, but maybe you're just using self-signed certificates and it's not a really rock solid TLS uh, implementation where trust has been established between the client and the server. And so uh, those are two situations where digest authentic authentication is preferable to basic authentication. So again, we're gonna walk through this process because it's very relevant to the attack that we're gonna show off today on our IoT camera. So this is basic authentication. The client sends a GET request with no authentication headers to the server. The server sends back a 401. It says, you are unauthorized. And then it sends in that header, www authenticate basic, and then some realm information. But it's this is the server telling the client, hey, you need to authenticate, and the method that I want you to use to authenticate is basic authentication. And then the client sends back an authorization header. Again, that is just a base64 encoded string of username colon password. And then that result is base64 encoded and sent over that request. Now let's take a look at digest authentication. So digest authentication, similarly, the client will send a unauthenticated you know, request to some kind of a resource. The server, likewise, will come back and say 401 unauthorized, but this time it will say www authenticate digest. And here we see a bunch of extra information that is sent across. And this is, we're not gonna get into this too much, but it's to prevent some uh, tampering and, and replay style attacks that are not relevant to our discussion today, but it says, hey, here's some information. I'm gonna need you, client, to perform digest authentication. And then the digest authentication, again, has a bunch of stuff in it where the client sends back, hey, this is my username, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff, but right here, this response is the key thing here. So this response is a function of a number of items that were sent in this initial request right here. So this nonce, this opaque value. So it's gonna, it's gonna hash some of those together, but it's also going to include the password in that hash that it sends and in this computed response right here so that the server can perform that same computation and then check that the hashes match, right? So doing this method, digest authentication, the client and server can both share the password, they can both know the password, but never communicate that password uh, in any kind of reversible format or, or, or in clear text over the untrusted network. And so this is objectively better than basic authentication if, and we're not gonna go into the downsides of digest authentication, there are some, but we're not gonna go into those today uh, but this is clearly better if the communications medium is not secure. So this leaves us the opportunity for a kind of cool attack, or at least I, I, I like these style of man in the middle network attacks. So again, the whole premise, the entire premise of using digest authentication is they assume that an attacker could be on the network and and they might be able to sniff traffic or perform a man in the middle attack, right? They could, they could uh, you know, do some, some funny business and, and we want to provide authentication that protects against that, right? So if the client will, will like openly support whatever form of authentication the server tells it to use, 
and this is all in unencrypted HTTP, which means we can modify it in transit if we're performing a man in the middle attack, then we can force the client, we, we, can, we can send the client that 401 you know, unauthenticated message and tell it dub to dub authenticate basic. Whereas the camera might only do digest authentication, right? It might not support, actually support basic authentication, but we can trick the client into giving us the clear text password to a uh, security camera like this. So with that, we are go we're gonna do, we're gonna do exactly that in our, in our little uh, example today. So uh, there's, li there's a little bit of setup uh, that I had to do here. So I have a packet capture that I'm not gonna do live uh, for, just uh, reasons of setup, but we are going to search through this PCAP for the RTSP uh, kind of uh, handshake that happens at the beginning here. And I'm going to go right click, follow TCP stream. It's gonna parse through those packets for a little bit. And here we can see the client and server communications for the video streaming. So we talked about HTTP authentication and basic and digest methods. The same exact methods are used oftentimes for RTSP authentication. So uh, same exact stuff here. We see a request, an RTSP request to stream video. And the server comes back, the camera comes back and says 401 unauthorized, right? And I want you to use digest authentication. And then we can see down here that this authorization digest header is provided. And uh, that is our mobile application performing the authentication and sending uh, and resending its request uh, for video streaming with the proper authentication in place. But like we're talking about, we can now trick the client. So uh, right here, I have the client set up on my mobile phone. And I do have a man in the middle set up, so I'm using art poisoning uh, and my man in the middle router set up. Uh, art poisoning is because uh, the phone and the camera are on the same network, and so in order to uh, redirect the RTSP stream to my server script here, so all this script is going to do is it is going to listen on port 5555. I have an IP tables rule set to redirect RTSP traffic to this uh, to this port 5555, and it is going to send this message here. So it's gonna send RTSP 401 unauthorized, dub 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 authenticate basic. So it's gonna tell the client, hey, let's use basic authentication today. So uh, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna set this up, and then we're going to go over here to our app, and we're going to go down here and do local streaming. And uh, we, see that we, we, we see that there's a little bit of failure. Obviously, if there's a real attack, we could clean that up. But right here, we see that our, our, uh, our client mobile application happily complied with that request to perform basic authentication. And then if we just echo out this base64 encoded stuff, and send it to base64 decode, we will see that it is, you know, admin colon password one exclamation, which is uh, the username and password for my camera. And so this is a vulnerability. You would be so surprised that uh, how, how far and wide I have found this vuln in uh, kind of every OnVIF client, every, every video streaming client out there will probably be vulnerable to this downgrade attack. And uh, so this is a good thing to hunt for. If you are a device manufacturer, my suggestion is that you have clear configurations because sometimes you do need to support basic authentication, right? Sometimes there is a device that will only support basic authentication and you want your, your mobile app, your, your, your video streaming application to be able to connect to that camera. That makes sense. What I would suggest in that case is that there are options per camera options to support or, or to disable the different forms of HTTP authentication and RTSP authentication. That's my suggestion. Um, but for you pen testers out there, this is a fun attack. And I want to see in the comments, are there any other cool 
protocol downgrade attacks because these are the kind of volumes I nerd out on. And if you want to learn more about the services that I offer for businesses, please check out my website at brownfinesecurity.com. Thank you. Have a good day.